Hey everyone, Chrono the Harlequin with Live from the Black Library here, and I'm gonna talk to you today about The End and the Death, Volume 1, Spoilers. The book we've been waiting for for over 17 years at this point. So it goes without warning, if you want to read the book completely fresh and completely unspoiled, this probably isn't the video for you. But a lot of spoilers have been floating around for quite some time now, so odds are you probably have some ideas about what things are happening in the book. Now, post-production note, I had been working on this video for a little bit up until this point, but just the other day, Chapter Master Valric did release a video on his channel talking about what happens and spoilers in the book, but he did get one or two things just a tiny bit wrong, which I will be addressing in this video, but don't worry, I will make it so that you don't have to have seen his video just to understand this one, but believe me, you should take a look at his video because his stuff is great and he is a really nice guy. But putting all that aside and getting right into it, this is the end of the world. Never in any book have I seen a better or more engaging depiction of the literal end of days. Not in the really grand, flashy, apocalyptic way, but in the depressing, slow grind as humanity just dies. The feeling of death as an end of things permeates this book so well. What made earlier installments in the Siege of Terra series so engaging, namely books like The Lost and the Damned or Saturnine, is completely absent from this book. Well, not completely absent, but certainly much less present than in other books in the series. Through the perspectives of various normal humans on the ground, we get to see just how far things have deteriorated for the regular people involved in this siege. While earlier we had the mass trembling horrified panic as war reached Terra and waves and waves of civilians were called up for conscript duty that was basically suicide, now all the people are left are hollow eyed, weeping, and utterly innervated. A lot of this is best portrayed through the eyes of some characters that we have really come to grow close to and get emotionally attached to over the journey of this series, namely Katsuhiro and Euphrates Keeler. For those who might not remember, Katsuhiro is a single individual conscripted soldier who we met very early on in the Siege of Terra, I think in either the Solar War or the Lost and the Damned, and we have watched as he has developed from a terrified, green, fatalistic conscript to a proper, grizzled veteran, someone who has slogged through this from start to finish, has seen comrades die left, right, and center, has watched bastions and towers fall, has watched immortal demigods die again and again in front of him and amount to nothing. We watched as he developed from atheistic and just generally aloof and detached from everyone to someone with a lot of faith in him, someone who really began to believe in the God Emperor as a god, and has now gone on to sort of question that faith and have it sort of become a background radiation in his mind. He is the epitome of the soldier who has slogged through this. I think his eardrums burst on no less than three occasions throughout these books. When we meet up with him nowadays, he's still nominally part of the religious conclave set up by Euphrates Keeler, the first imperial saint, and has been carrying around an orphaned child with him that was given to him by a white scar marine, Shiban Khan. He's carrying around this child, he's just doing what he can, and doing his best to stay alive and help those around him. He's not really concerned with his survival that much anymore, he's just doing what he can. It is honestly a shame because we did get to see a lot more of him in previous books, but then again it is only fair that he starts to get sidelined more and more because Listen, this is the end of days. This is a war of gods and kings. It's really not gonna do that much to the story to focus on some guy. But that being said, in The End and the Death Volume 2, I really, really hope we get to see an ending to his narrative arc and see what becomes of him rather than him just having blinked out of existence because that has happened to some characters. Like we met two Alpha Legion operatives who were working on the planet alongside Katsuhiro that Part of a side story with him was that he was searching for them to try and hunt them down because he feels responsible for not having stopped them earlier, and that storyline is just dropped earlier on, and like, I hope that doesn't happen with Katsuhiro himself, I hope we get to see where he ends up, I hope he doesn't just fade into the background. But cutting past that and getting to the real meat and potatoes, uh, the world is ending. Yeah, Terra is actually at this point being sucked into the warp more or less. 
The warp storms around Terra are so concentrated, it may as well be in like the warp or the eye of terror. It's that bad. And Terra itself is rapidly turning into a demon world. Walls start turning into flesh-like material. The ground undulates. People lose their minds left, right, and center. Mutations and monsters are sprouting up all over the place. There's actually a scene where a traitor titan grows wings and there are what are effectively demon engines flying overhead. The people think they're planes, but then notice you can hear the sounds of muscles moving and wings flapping and animalistic noises and breathing from these creatures. Terra is becoming a demon world. Moreover, the influence of the Dark Gods themselves is becoming very apparent in day-to-day -day life in terms of what is effectively psychological warfare. And now an excerpt, if you'll allow me. The Emperor must die. The Emperor must die. It's written on the tattered walls and gouged into stricken ramparts. It's written in the paint and tar, pitch and ash. It's written in blood. It's written everywhere, daubed up, marked by hand, cut with blade, or scorched by burns. In some places, the words have simply appeared, formed by no living hand at all. The words have risen from stone, like blisters, like urticaria, like scarification. The Emperor must die. The Emperor must die. It is a chant, too, bellowed by a million voices. It fills the air and it covers the walls. Around that slogan, where it is marked, other words are written. Threats, menaces, the iconography of the burgeoning darkness, the malign symbols of etheric power. Four words, four names from which there are eight, the false gods, and one other name too, with increasing repetition. Now, as we can see, this is direct psychological warfare from the dark gods themselves, essentially trying to implant the names of the gods into people and get them to start worshiping them, start trying to turn more and more people over to their side. And this extends further beyond than just spawning demons on Terra, or causing mutations, or spreading disease, or even putting up the Emperor Must Die everywhere. It actually goes into the sense of time. Namely, Terra itself is now, since it's essentially in the warp, stuck in a time loop. Since time doesn't exist in a linear sense in the warp or to the gods, Terra has essentially been stuck in time, and this effect has been exacerbated deliberately by the gods in order to fuck with people's minds and mess with their sanity. Make people despair, take them into this world of madness where things don't make sense because of how reliant humans are on the linear flow of time. But the funny thing is, Malkador himself acknowledges this was a massive, fatal blunder on their end, because while yes, it is screwing with people, it's buying them time they need. Everyone has essentially come to accept at this point that Terra will fall tomorrow. This is the last day of the Imperium. But they have spent literal months waiting for the tomorrow that will never come. And as such, humans have continued to plan in this linear, moment-to-moment, day-to-day sense to keep themselves going just that little bit longer, just that little bit longer, because the gods have given them the infinite today in the face of the final tomorrow. That right there is just a little tidbit I find so cool and so interesting to have included. The problem with that, though, is that even though this extra time has been bought to allow Gilliman and the Relief Force to come and relieve the siege and save the Imperium, Gilliman can't find Terra. He's actually in the Soul System, but the planet itself is so covered in dense warp storm that he can't find the planet. So the only hope they really have is to keep the Astronomicum burning at maximum power. To this effect, the Dark Angels, led by Corswain and his rival Zahariel, who is actually one of the Fallen, are defending the Hollow Mountain against the Death Guard attacks in order to keep the Astronomicon lit. We get a lot of really cool character moments between Zahariel and Corswain here, rationalizations of why Zahariel is doing what he's doing, what his ultimate plans are, we see him take up the mantle of Lord Cypher, things like that. If you're a Dark Angels fan, you'll enjoy that part of the book, I personally found it cool. And on a similar note, all those space marines and civilian troops that were locked outside of the Eternity Gate when it shut have effectively come to terms with the fact that they're gonna die. We see White Scars and Blood Angels fighting alongside each other who have begun referring to themselves as quote-unquote death sellers. The term really meaning that, oh, we know we're gonna die, but we're effectively selling our lives out here seeing what price we can get. We see a White Scar firing at Sons of Horus Marines. 
Oh, 44? Am I worth 44? No, I'm worth more than that. 45. Uh, can I get 46? Can I get 46? He's essentially like an auctioneer for his own death. And seeing space marines like this, but also the descriptions of them broken, scattered, and dead all over the floor, also really adds to that mental image of absolute desolation and despair. We see a line in the book that specifically says, from this point on, the Astartes will be relegated to elite shock troops and spear tip assaults. They will never be this innumerable, unstoppable force ever again. And understandably, this sounds all absolutely awful. And you would think, if things are going this badly for the Loyalists, things must be going absolutely awesome for the traitors. They must be so happy because they're inches from victory. This is their moment of glory right at hand. Well, the answer to that is no. Like, there are entire chapters in this book dedicated to displaying just how badly traitor forces have deteriorated in terms of a command standpoint and in morale. This is best displayed through Abaddon, who, in my opinion, has been one of the characters that has benefited the most from the Siege of Terra series. Abaddon's portrayal in this series has made him honestly one of my more favorite characters, at least through the heresy setting, as opposed to maybe modern 40k where he's just like a cartoon villain. They're trying to do some stuff with him, but honestly it's a little too late for him at this point. But in the heresy and Siege of Terra especially, he's so interesting to read about and you can relate to him so much, you really feel for him. Especially here, where he, as the first captain, has been given full battlefield command since Horus has withdrawn all the way back into his ship to command from his dais and to do battle with the Emperor in the war. So you'd think that since Abaddon is effectively operating with the full authority of Horus on the ground, oh, people are going to listen. He's going to be able to keep people together. But again, absolutely not. We watch him frustratedly giving repeated commands to his subordinates and underlings to withdraw back to his position, let's form up, let's make some kind of cohesive anything, and being flatly ignored time and time again. Everyone is off following their own goals and chasing their own glory and engaging on their own fronts. There's several captains he tries to contact and they're all in different places, some with other sons of Horus, some with Death Guard, some with word bearers, things like that. But what they do have in common is that Abaddon recognizes none of them are answering his commands because they all believe he wants the glory. He's only calling them back so he can lead the charge, and they don't want that to happen. The respect for command and trust among brothers that was once such a deep part of the Sons of Horus and earlier Luna Wolves is completely gone as these debauched individuals storm the gates as this undisciplined rabble. Now, the reason that Abaddon is trying to call everyone back is because he has learned from Argonus, Horus's equerry, that Horus has lowered the void shields of the Vengeful Spirit to lure the Emperor in as a trap. Now, at this point, and honestly long before, Abaddon has completely given up on Horus. He still views him, yes, he's my father, he's the first man, I will follow him into death, but he has just completely let him go on a, like, a deeper emotional level because he recognizes what his father has become. Utterly insane. And yes, we can see Abaddon effectively coping, trying to convince himself, oh, this trap must be masterful, something is in the works, he's got something cooking, but deep down, Abaddon knows Horus has completely lost his mind. And like other people before him, like the warsmith Forex, Abaddon has really checked out of the siege, and we can really see that here in the book. He's just fighting because there's nothing left for him to do. He's just fighting for the sake of victory. But there's no real meaning behind the fight anymore. And for his part, Horus comes across as completely delusional. And that's good, because he is. At this point in the siege, we see what was once earlier smaller quirks, like mistaking his new equerry Argonus for being his old equerry Malakurst, the one who died all the way back in Slaves to Darkness, as being fully front and center, to the point where Horus sees quote-unquote Malakurst and says, you know, I never actually realized before, but Malakurst kind of bears an uncanny resemblance to that guy Argonus. It's weird, right? And he also consistently imagines people who are also dead being present in the room with him, people like Zardu Laic, or even Mercedi Olaton. It's essentially gotten to the point where Abaddon and Argonus are effectively running the siege in his stead, Argonus being the voice of commands coming from the Vengeful Spirit, and Abaddon being the man on the ground. 
Looking back at the ashen, diminished figure that Horus has become in this book is such a stark contrast from who he used to be earlier in books like Fulgrim and even Horus Rising. It's such a shock to the system, and it's all portrayed really well. That's one recurring theme throughout the entire book that really does it justice. It shows just how hopeless and how much everything has fallen on all sides. The world feels so hollow. Everyone is exhausted and scraping it out to the very last of their abilities, despite everything before them. Everyone's on the brink of giving up, but just refuses to. And it's at this low point of pure hopelessness, there's only one question anyone's asking. What in the name of the throne has that go-getter John Grammaticus been up to? I am so glad that we could take time out from the knife's edge of the entire fucking galaxy to focus on John Grammaticus. I'm so happy John Grammaticus is here to just shine a light on things and that we can spend some time with him. Let's not lose sight of what really matters at the end of fucking days. Every time we put the brakes on the fucking end of the world to talk about this guy, I feel like fucking Dave Chappelle. Somebody call John Grammaticus so I can make sense of all this! So, biting that bullet and talking about it, John Grammaticus, Olanius Pearson, and his retinue, which John Grammaticus has affectionately named the Argonauts, are making their way towards the Imperial Throne Room in order to warn the Emperor and stop him from confronting Horus directly, just doing whatever they can to aid him and stop him from dying and therefore stop the Imperium from collapsing. They're aided by one of the prototype Space Marines known as Litu, who was a protector of the now-deceased Mother of the Primarchs Erda, and a blind woman calling herself Akte, who is actually the Lady Cyrene, who was a holy woman of the Wordbearers Legion, and an Alpha Legion Marine identifying himself as Alpharius. All of this was established in the previous entries in the Siege of Terra, but in this book, we find out why Alpharius is here and who he actually is. The secret being, it's actually First Captain Ingo Peck, someone John Grammaticus has a history with ever since the book Legion all the way back at the very beginning of the heresy, because of fucking course he does, why wouldn't he? From Peck, we learned that the Alpha Legion were given a set of psi-coded directives with a trigger word in order to prepare for every eventuality. This is best covered in an excerpt, if you'll allow me. This comes on the tale of Ingo Peck explaining to John Grammaticus why exactly there are all these tunnels leading into the Imperial Palace that the Alpha Legion knows about. That being, Dorn left them there intentionally as a contingency, but when the Alpha Legion found out, they started stashing resources there in any eventuality, namely warriors in stasis and equipment. Dorn expected to lose? He decided to win, says Altharius, but he is meticulous. He prepared for every eventuality. We, in turn, secured it for use. What use? Well, there's the thing. For whatever was needed, John. Once the Cabal's plan was ditched, we prepared for every eventuality. Move in, in support of the throne. Attack, in support of Lupercal. Whichever turned out to be the smartest tactic. Uh, let me get this straight. You waited to see who would win, before deciding which side you were on? A crude summary, John. We waited to see how it would play out so we could intervene to our own maximum advantage. And this is you doing that, asks John. You helping us? That's the side you've come down on? Not at all. Alpharius is silent for a moment, as if deciding whether to say more. It's clear Horus has to be stopped. Whatever he is, John, this isn't a civil war anymore. It's not a war master turning on his king. It's not politics. It's not even a material war at this point. All the rules have changed. This is about preventing the full and final extinction of human culture. So we are on the same page, says John. John, I was sent here to begin a rapid response activation of the buried sleeper forces. Awaken them from Susan so they could begin combat operations. Against Horus? Overtly. We don't have the numbers, but, as you may remember, we can be surgically effective. The thing is, John, the Astartes we buried here have no idea what they're waking up to. They went into stasis without knowing which side they'd be on when they came round. To ensure chain of command and doctrine imperative, they were all preconditioned to respond to code words. We had a list. One word, John. Auto-hypnotically implanted at the moment of revival, and the warrior would instantly understand his parameters and instantly obey them. One word? Yes. Each one is a planned condition. 
Sagittarius triggered loyalty to Horus. Xenophon triggered loyalty to the Emperor. Paramus triggered a directive of mutual annihilation to bring down both if it was deemed necessary. Good God! This speed triggered evacuation and withdrawal. Orpheus triggered a policy to ignore both sides and focus on chaos itself, to fight it, or seize the means to control it, and so on and so on. There were many. Every contingency, every possible option. Hypno-coded. I was sent to initiate Condition Xenophon. Loyalty to the Emperor? Correct. Alright, says John. He shrugs. That's a start. Why does telling me this by my trust? Because I had only just started when she arrived and found me. You mean Octae? Alpharius nods. And? You can see her power, John. I'm not doing this voluntarily. Quite the opposite. She has me entirely in her control. Everything I'm doing, I'm doing against my will, and I can't resist. John points to the side damper. Well, you can now. That shut her out. It's merely muted her, John, very briefly. Whatever. She can't keep up that kind of mental control forever. She doesn't have to. When she found me, she read my mind and triggered one of the code words in me. I'm aware of it, but I can do very little about it, and I'm operating on a planned condition, and that, he gestures to the damper, is allowing me, briefly, enough free will to beg you to trust me and assist me. What? For old time's sake? Yes, let's say that. John nods, raises his eyebrow. So who are you, old friend? I'm pretty certain you know already, John. You've been carefully monitoring my voice patterns. Ingo Peck. Correct. What was it? John asks. What was the code word, Peck? Orpheus. Shit. Fight chaos directly? Or seize control of it? Peck nods. Why? Because that's what she wants. She wants this war stopped. This form of the war. She sees Horus as a puppet. A ragdoll so steeped in the warp he's utterly enslaved by it. But he's strong. You know how strong Horus Lupercal is, John. The witch believes he can be turned. From chaos? You mean saved? Peck shakes his head. Towards chaos, John. She thinks he can be turned to face it. She believes he's strong enough to take hold of the shackles it has placed upon him, shrug off its control, and use those same shackles to enslave it. Chaos? Yes, John. Enslave chaos? Yes, John. Well, then she's a colossal freaking idiot, he says. Peck laughs, but there's no real joy in it. The enslavement of chaos has been a dream of many for a long time. Everyone thinks they can do it. Lupercal, the Phoenician, Lord Aurelian, the Pale King, even that twisted little bastard Erebus, the so-called Hand of Destiny. They all thought they could do it, and they've all ended up slaves to darkness. That's the way it works. No one can do it. They think they have enslaved the warp, but that's just the warp telling them what they want to hear while it merely pulls their strings. The Emperor, says John. Perhaps. If anyone could. Once. Not now. This wouldn't be happening if he had succeeded in doing where everyone else had failed. But the witch thinks she can? She considers herself a Hand of Destiny too, John. A better one. She thinks she can steer Horus, correct his course, adjust his approach. Even this late in the game, she believes she can use him as an instrument, and because he is so very strong, master chaos. I refer you to my previous statement, says John. Okay, putting that one-liner aside, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in this passage. Namely, we finally have proof positive of what the Alpha Legion's alignment is in the heresy. Ingo Peck is a very high-ranking member of the Alpha Legion, and to know that he personally was given the directive to instigate Xenophon really shows how committed the Alpha Legion higher-ups, namely Omegon, was to the Emperor's cause. And it confirms the theory that many people have had that Omegon, or the person named Omegon, was loyal from the beginning. Because we do know for a fact one of the twins did die on Pluto. That is confirmed, but we don't know where the other one is after the Horus Heresy. But that doesn't really take into account right now. Furthermore, we don't really know which twin is which, because it is implied at the end of Alpharius Head of the Hydra that the twins did switch names and switch places, maybe permanently. So, whichever twin is still alive, be it Alpharius or the Omegon, but is now named Omegon, they were loyal. So the Alpha Legion was loyal up until the very end of the heresy. 
even if the entire Legion didn't know that. This is actually furthered by the fact that Ingo Peck, along with John Grammaticus and the group, encounter another Alpha Legionary later on that we also met all the way back in Legion, Matthias Herzog. Now, unfortunately, Ingo actually has to kill him because he tries to kill John Grammaticus. Now, where this whole thing ends up is the fact that Ingo Peck begs John Grammaticus to stop Acte and, moreover, if necessary, stop Peck himself, because Peck can no longer control himself since he is being forced to work on Orpheus at the behest of Acte. And interestingly, this whole thing Acte is working towards, the idea of controlling Horus and using him as a pure vessel to contain chaos and eventually enslave it, is an ideology that has survived all the way into the 41st millennium. It's called Horusianism, and there's even a whole book series, which I have mentioned before on the channel, by John French called The Horusian Wars, which is a really good book series. Now, as cool as this all is, it does lead into something that is more significant. I know, very rare for a John Grammaticus bit, but after John Grammaticus incapacitates Peck by putting a motion-activated bomb on his armor when he isn't looking and telling him, if you move, you'll blow up, I promise I'll come back to you, you know, because we're just like the best pals ever, to the point where Ingo Peck actually goes out of his way to save John Grammaticus' life and then tells him, we might not be all on the same side, but I'm on your side, John. <sighs> I'm sorry, like, I just, I keep getting off track with that, I just, I have such strong feelings about this entire fucking arc. Now, after they interrogate Octay by torturing her with the Psy Damper for a little bit, they do eventually make it to the Imperial Palace, but are promptly detained and have all their things confiscated. Though, while being taken away by the Custodians towards the throne room, Vulcan actually does hear them out and let them speak, because he remembers John Grammaticus. Because, of course he does! Why wouldn't the stars fucking align for John Grammaticus? Hey everyone, let's let John Grammaticus in. Oh, what, that's it? You broke into the fucking Imperial Palace and are here with the shadiest fucking pretext ever at the 11th fucking hour where we can't take risks? Sure, come on in! You're, you're John Grammaticus! You literally saved my life, even though I'm a nigh unkillable god. Hey everyone, the Emperor just left to fight Horus and Gilliman's nine hours away, but don't worry, John Grammaticus is here! We're fucking saved! I am so glad that at the end of everything, we get to spend it with John Grammaticus. And of course, the Emperor has already left. The quest was entirely moot. They completely failed, as they've always done throughout the entire heresy. So this was an complete waste of time. We have gotten next to nothing out of these people, aside from them just butchering the lore of the Alpha Legion into an incomprehensible mess, and the knowledge that they're not going to affect anything because we know how the heresy ends. Look, I understand the reason for including these people, but, well, maybe I don't because of the whole Alanius Pius thing, but you need to add different elements because we already know how the story ends. You need to throw us a few curveballs, but this was not it. This was a foul ball that hit someone in the audience in the head and killed them. But at the very least, at this ending juncture here, we get something of note, which is when Octe breaks down and finally explains to people what exactly the whole Dark King thing is, where she reveals the truth of what Horus is really becoming, a new god of chaos called the Dark King. This is huge, and this is something that has come up over and over again earlier in the book. Malkador had been drawing the Dark King tarot card and asked about it when Vulcan was speaking, and a fifth name, as stated earlier, along with the names of the four Chaos Gods, this being the Dark King. This name has come up ad nauseum until this point, and we're led to believe it's sort of just a pseudonym for Horus, in the same way that the Custodes and Malkador and others keep calling the Emperor my King of Ages, but now, at the very end of the book, near the final pages, it's revealed to be so much more than that. But there actually was, weirdly enough, a hint to this at the very opening pages of the book, narrated by none other than the demon Samus. The first passage of the book begins with Samus narrating how this war is so pointless, it's such a petty squabble, fighting over this dirt ball they call Terra, it's amusing to him how they value it so much and are fighting basically on pure instinct at this point. But he also remarks how everyone fighting is naive, because they don't really grasp the scale of the battle. It's not about the symbolism of the planet or the planet itself, this battle is everywhere. And in his condemnation of this quote-unquote pointless fight, he also stops to consider what would happen if one of them realizes what is quote-unquote possible, what can be accomplished here, the quote, beautiful potential as he puts it. And he comments on how 
it, not specifying what it is, is closer now than it ever was even in the untimes of the war that broke heaven. He specifically names three people, in an excerpt if you'll allow me. Hormon has the courage to reach for it. So few of them, so very few, even in a position to see it or comprehend its meaning. I can count them on my fingers. Him, the boastful king, on his tiny throne, his feeble light guttering out. Him, the squealing pretender, hunched in the howling boat of hell. Him, perhaps, the maniac prophet slithering through the open wounds with the unblinking stars one of them might see before it is too late what could be achieved today. One of them might recognize, at the very last, that none of this matters. The annihilating rock, the measureless slaughter, the pathetic rage, unless they elevate the war to where it truly belongs. Not here, not terror, but outwards and inwards and everywhere, until that which is a ruin, and that which is a ruin alone, it was in the beginning, and it shall be in the end, is everywhere and everything. That is the only victory that matters. That is the only end that has any meaning. Alert, intrigued, alive not to the death of a rock, but to the birth of a reality, I watch. I am Samus. My name is Samus. I am the man beside you. Samus is here. I walk into your meaningless flames. And I rejoice. For this time, perhaps this time, there will be a victory. For this is the end, and the death, and finally, the beginning. So as we can see, this is the big reveal that the entire book has been building up to since the very beginning what this Dark King is, and moreover, what's truly at stake here, what Horus could possibly achieve. Moreover, it also lends more credence to the idea that the Emperor will become a god soon if he isn't already one. I don't think he already is one, but I think he absolutely will become one. Because this shows it is possible for a mortal being to become a god. Normally people thought, oh, that's relegated for warp entities, that's the only thing for them, like Belakor or Vastor or Malal, but this is proof that you can ascend to godhood. And even Samus himself doesn't really know which of the people involved is going to be the one to do it, but that someone might be able to at this juncture because of how much energy is just swirling around here. But the book at the very end, through Octae, portrays a very horrifying truth of the matter. That being, Horus's ascension to godhood will mean the near total extinction of the human race, similar to the Eldari. Octae confirms that his birth will consume most of the species, and when people question this, saying, hey, that doesn't really sound right, it can't be, an entire psychic race had to die for Slaanesh to be born. She says, that's the ultimate fate of all really civilized psychic races, and Horus is our future. There's nothing we can do to stop it. She's given up and accepted this as the future. But then I cannot help but ask, then what happens when the Emperor finally truly ascends to godhood? Is the species going to be consumed? I don't think so. I just couldn't possibly see it happening that way. And actually, while recording this, a theory has just struck me. This book is by Dan Abnett, but what's also by Dan Abnett are the Bequin trilogy of Inquisition books, you know, sequel to the Ravener books, which were sequel to the Eisenhorn trilogy, you get the idea, which mention the King in Yellow, a mysterious criminal lord who is very warp powerful and seems to be trying to gain the name of the Emperor for whatever reason. It is revealed at the end of the second book in that series, which I think is the latest one, to be Constantin Valdor. He's been missing for 10,000 years, but we finally know where he's been, essentially working as this weird warp mafia boss crime lord person. And I think maybe the Emperor would consume much of humanity if he did ascend, and Valdor knows this, because Valdor is gaining a lot of dark arcane knowledge through his weapon, the Apollonian Spear, which grants him the knowledge of whatever he kills with it. And when he boards the vengeful spirit with the Emperor, he's killing demons left and right, and then eventually realizes after gaining their knowledge, Wait, the Ventral Spirit is itself a demon. It's alive, so he plunges his spear into it and speaks the name Vengeful Spirit because that gives him some power over the ship itself. Because if you have the name of a warp entity or a demon, then you get power over it. I think that is his end game to get the name of the Emperor to stop the Emperor from ascending to Godhood in order to save the race, thereby upholding the Emperor's will. Because we start to see Valdor's kind of losing it a little bit. He's starting to crack under the stress on the Vengeful Spirit and even before then. 
it's honestly been a big mystery in the fandom for now, why Constantine has become the king in yellow, why he's doing what he's doing, why he wants the Emperor's name seemingly, and I think this is the reason. In order to stop the Emperor from inadvertently destroying humanity, because it is stated in this book, Godhood does not require consent. But there's also a third name that's listed in this diatribe by Samos. In fact, the whole thing reveals two characters who are probably, to my theory, going to be very important in the following volume of this book. Namely, Samus himself, because we have to remember, all the way back at the beginning of the Siege of Terra, back in the Solar War, he is the first person to say, I am the end and the death. And now here he is commentating at the very beginning of the book. Yeah, he's going to show up in the next volume, and I think he's going to do something big. But in his dialogue, he also mentions a third person who might realize what's at stake here and could possibly ascend. The quote, maniac prophet slithering between the stars. That's Lorgar in my mind. That can't not be Lorgar. And we know it probably is going to be Lorgar involved in this in some way, because Barthusa Naharek is revealed in literally one throwaway line of text to be on Terra and ready in waiting. Barthus Hanarek being the loyalist, well, sort of loyalist, word bearer who was working alongside Eldrad Ulthran in his quest to wipe out the Cabal because the Cabal wanted to wipe out humanity by ensuring Horus' victory because they believed if humanity was wiped out after Horus took power, thereby sacrificing humanity but letting the galaxy as a whole survive. The rise of the Dark King sort of serves as effective proof positive that the Cabal was more or less wrong and that the Alpha Legion was right to abandon them and instead decide to side with the Emperor as opposed to siding with Horus like the Cabal had wanted. And aside from that, Barthus and Naharik's main plan was to personally kill Lorgar in order to save his Legion from damnation, which I don't think he's going to be able to accomplish. We lost sight of him many, many books ago, and this is actually his first appearance in the Siege of Terra series. He landed with other word bears who he killed upon making planet fall, because I think they were traitors, he was just hiding amongst them, and now he basically has a sniper rifle and is taking up position, shooting whoever he comes across with regular ammunition, but has one bullet made of fulgurite that he's saving for Lorgar. Fulgurite being a stone, in reality, that is formed when lightning strikes sand, but in 40k, it is solidified essence of the Emperor's power itself, and can do a lot. John Grammaticus actually used a Fulgurite dagger to heal Vulcan of his madness by killing him with it and then giving Vulcan his perpetuality. That's really stupid. I hate that plotline, but it's part of the thing. Now, I doubt Naharik is going to actually be able to kill Lorgar. He's probably going to whiff the shot in some way, but I believe he will at the very least injure him, thereby stopping him from becoming a god or intervening in any capacity. That's going to come to a head, but I don't think a conclusion is going to be all that satisfying. They're mostly just tying up a loose end at that point. Now, aside from this, there are other big reveals throughout the book, as you would expect for a book of this magnitude. Namely, we finally have a probable idea of what the Terminus Decree is. For those who don't know, the Grey Knights have held on to something called the Terminus Decree ever since their creation, and it's always been a bit of a mystery as to what it truly is. There was a general idea that it's something incredibly catastrophic that could wipe out humanity in the event that it seemed chaos was going to win, and we would rather kill the species to deny them victory than let them take over. Throughout the Siege of Terra series, we have seen a character named Basilio Fo, who has been imprisoned within the Kungbamaru prison complex for his crimes. But these aren't just any crimes. His deeds date all the way back to the Age of Strife, where he would work alongside various warlords on Terra as a prime geneticist. He didn't really have any grand ideals, but he used his immense knowledge in genetic manipulation and other such scientific fields to sort of play. He considered himself an artist. He was just messing around, but he is considered one of the highest level war criminals in Imperial history. He sided against the Emperor on many occasions, even fighting alongside Nartham Dune, one of the last great dictators to oppose the Emperor's unification of Terra. So as understandably, he's been locked up for quite some time. Throughout the Siege of Terra, there's been a consistent plotline of him being essentially commissioned to create a bioweapon that would wipe out the genetic template of all Astartes and other transhuman warriors, and make it so that none could ever be made again. He is successful in this, and that weapon has now been commandeered at the very end of the Siege of Terra. Namely, it was commandeered by order of Malkador the Sigilite himself. He gave this order as a psychic projection 
to his chosen, who we know to be the foundations of the original Inquisition. It was actually going to be taken by the Custodes, but the Chosen of Malkador stepped in, believing they should be the ones to have it. And I firmly believe it is this virus or template that is still on Titan as the Terminus Decree, because the request to seize it by Malkador was marked as a quote-unquote Terminus level decree. That language is way too specific to just be a coincidence. It's basically confirmed that that's what the Terminus decree that the Grey Knights have really is. But also interestingly, the person who seizes it is one of Malkador's chosen named Xanthus. And to those of us more well-versed in Inquisition lore, that name should stick out because he is the original Xanthite. Xanthites, in Inquisition terminology, are Inquisitors who believe in using Chaos and dabbling in the powers of the Warp in order to fight Chaos. Many people believe, hey, that's just heresy under a different name. That's very dangerous. You will almost always fall into corruption. And radical Xanthite Inquisitors, even the most radical ones called the Horusians, consistently end up being corrupted and becoming villains in books. Xanthus himself is actually executed for his beliefs by being burnt at the stake around M32. I'm not sure if it's before or after the War of the Beast, but he does die for these beliefs, though his legacy does live on. I just think that's very interesting to see his name come up in this book. Another one of Malkador's chosen who comes up is Moriana. If you've read the Iron Warriors novella involving Honsu, or the Black Legion books by Aaron Dembski Bowden, that name will stick out because she abandons the Imperium altogether and joins forces with Chaos. She becomes a top tier advisor to Abaddon himself and then later Honsu. That's insane. To see her name come up and know where she ends up, how far she falls, is really interesting. And I absolutely hate this character, honestly. I thought she was interesting, but now I just despise her. Like, one of Malkador's last acts was to send a psychic projection to you and entrust his last will and testament to you, among other people, and this is where you end up? Look, I know it's actually really interesting from a narrative standpoint, but this is just me being petty because I was always really attached to Malkador. It's like, Egh. Speaking of the big M himself, a lot of this book does come from the perspective of Malkador, and that's where we gain a lot of really interesting insights into the Emperor and the way Malkador thinks and how everything was set up. A lot of my favorite parts of this book are the ones from Malkador's perspective. And the scene where he ascends to the Golden Throne is absolutely gut-wrenching. Now, before this point, the first half of the book has a lot of sections narrated from Malkador's POV, where he says the line, I am old and I am tired at nauseam. He would say things like, I am old, I am tired, I sit in a wooden pew, I am old, I am tired, I sit in a supplicant's chair, I am old, I am no longer tired. It comes up ad nauseum, and it all comes to a head in this excerpt if you'll allow me. I have neither the time nor patience, frankly, to interrogate Sanguinius's curious silence. I turn to my impassive lord. Now? I ask. He tells me yes. Already? Uh, I sigh. It's foolish. I've been prepared for this moment since the day we realized that Magnus was no longer a viable candidate. My lord has been unwavering in his reassurance to me. He believes me capable, and I trust that. For our minds have been strangely entwined for a long time. Long before he took up the title Emperor, and I became a Sigilite. It's not that I wanted longer. I've had enough years. More than my fair share. But there's still so very much to do. However, in truth, I wish this had happened when I was younger and stronger, and invulnerable with the recklessness of youth, rather than now, when I am so old and so tired. Not that it would really have made any difference. Still, I'm lost in my thoughts as I begin to limp my way towards the great Dias, ordering my mind settling my estate, frantically sending out last moment thought notes and idea symbols, reminders and instructions, so that others can finish what I shall leave unfinished. I am so lost in my thoughts I do not pay attention to what's going on around me. I stop short when I hear a gasp. It would stop anyone to hear Primarchs gasp in surprise and dread, and hear them fall to their knees in abject obeisance. At the foot of the gleaming Dias I look up. I look up the exquisite steps that I will climb and never come down again. The sun is in my eyes. My lord. My king of ages. My friend. My master of mankind. 
He stands. He has risen from the golden throne. He stands above me like the god he isn't. He stands. That in itself is a minor miracle, for he had not stood in a long time, and I was beginning to fear he could not. Cloth of golden light hangs from his frame and his arms, streaked with trace threads of crimson sunset and scarlet dawn. Microclimate lightning sheets and shivers around him, and corpus and sloths like blue ice from the arms of the throne at his back. There is a halo of white radiance behind his noble head, bright as the full hunter's moon or a steadfast star. His face casts a shadow, an eclipse before that disk, but for the splendor of his eyes. Powers that be, I had forgotten this. I had forgotten his majesty. I had forgotten how tall he was, how astronomic, how wonderful, how terrible. How... How did I ever think I could take his place? What kind of old and tired fool am I? I, I ought to bow. I need to bow down. I need to abase myself and bury my face in the stones of the floor, for he's too bright to behold. I fuss and fumble, clumsily, my old limbs too stiff to obey me. I stumble. Hands catch me, and arrest my fall before I crack my face against the lower steps of the Dias. The Sentinels, Uzcaral and Kalectus, have swept from their posts at the moment of my misstep, but they have not reached me in time. The hands supporting me belong to Rogel and Sanguinius. Vulcan is with them, his hand extended to help me upright. Constantine looms behind them, concern in his eyes. Let me help you, says Sanguinius. Oh, forgiven old man, I mutter. Steady yourself, says Rogel. I'm as steady as ever, my boy, I chuckle. They set me on my feet. Vulcan hands me my staff. I look at them. They surround me. Their worry for me showing on their faces. I shoo them away. I'm fine, I assure them. These old legs, when you get to my age, eh? Sanguinius looks at me. His jaw tightens. I'm fine, I insist. Above me, my king of ages awaits. He remains standing, motionless, silent, ignoring the awe that fills the throne room. All eyes upon him. Eyes that never thought to see him stir or stand again. They have longed for him to rise, and now they are terrifying of what his rising signifies. He looks only to me, right into my heart. Halfway up the steps I pause. I glance at the dutiful sentinels either side of me. That's far enough now, I say. I'll go the rest of the way alone. Their golden masks express no remorse. You are both Hatrion companions, yes? I ask them quietly. Likely, then, that one or both of you will go with him toward his side on the final fight. I ask you this, then. Do not fail him. We are not conditioned to fail, my regent. Oh, I know that, my boy. I know all that. I know how peerless you are. And I'm not talking about devotion or duty or ability. Those things are wired into you. I'm talking about... about... when it's all done, I mean. Bring him back to this seat, you hear me? Bring him back alive. You do all you do for him, but do this for me. Here, here, I lick the tip of my left index finger, and with it, I draw my sigil on the breast of Calactus's plate. The mark is gone as soon as it's made. Then, with another lick, I do the same to Uzcaral. I leave my mark, the mark of myself, upon my plan, I whisper as I draw the shape. This is what will happen, and with my hand I signify it. It cannot be undone. Do this for me. I near the top, the light around me. My lord and master moves. He steps down to me and offers me his hand in support. That hand, that great and capable hand that has held the galaxy in its palm. I feel him close. To my surprise, he permits me to share the private working of his mind. The signs I read there are clear. Don't be sad, I say. This is more painful than he expected it to be. He is afraid he will never speak to me again, that there will be no more hours spent exchanging thoughts and words, configuring mankind's best fate. His memories are Antarctic bright. The day he first showed me the throne, 
and told me what it did. The shining look of disbelief in my eyes. The evening we both realized that I could moderate its functions too. That my mind, like his, had the capacity to engage with it and not instantly perish. The night we concluded, through plain, logical deduction, that there might come a day when I would have to take his place. That, in almost every configuration of the future we could model, someone would have to do it. I was not afraid. Not then, not now. I knew what that would mean. I brushed it off as a thing that would happen when it came to it. He hoped it never would, because he knew what it would mean too. And for the longest time, it seemed unlikely. We had built a contingency to avoid it ever becoming compulsory. The contingency's name was Magnus. Now the time is here, I do not hesitate. I take the hand he offers to steady me, and I ascend the final steps to the throne. I give him a nod, and a little smile, and whisper to him, Do not mourn, in a voice no one else can hear. And then I prepare to take my seat. There's nothing else to say. After centuries of conversation, in which we have dissected and shared everything, there is nothing left to say. Just to look from one friend to another. An unspoken understanding of everything that has passed between us, and the debts we owe each other. This act is my final, everlasting gift to mankind. To the future. To the plan painted on the wall. But in his eyes, I can tell he knows that I am only really doing it for him. The greatest, most universal acts are always born from the personal. I am old. I am tired. I sit upon the golden throne. Now this book is really long, it's about a thousand pages, but there's a few key moments that really define the various hard points as the story progresses, and yeah, this is one of them. This fucking hurt. There's a few moments, very few moments, in the Horus Heresy where I've been near tears. I've never fully cried, but this was one of those moments where I started to feel my eyes sting. I know that might sound lame, but this one just hurt. And kudos to Dan Abnett, because We've known this happens since the 80s, and we've been preparing ourselves for this for over 17 years now. So his ability to not have the impact lessened, and in fact almost made worse in a way by the fact that we knew it was coming, I think is really commendable, and does show some of his chops as an author, because I have been giving him the business earlier on in here, I have been riffing on him pretty hard, especially with the John Grammaticus thing, and just the perpetual storyline in general. But these are moments that prove yeah, he is a really good author and has earned his sort of place at the top in regards to the Black Library uh, community of authors. Now, aside from the emotional impact of losing Malkador in this way, we do get a lot of really interesting character insight into the Emperor himself from Malkador's perspective at this last juncture. It's often been a big source of contention between the fans and, yeah, even certain authors in regards to how the Emperor feels about the people around him. Does he just blindly use everyone? Or is there something in him? Does he have that humanity to him that makes him feel something when he does have to eventually and inevitably discard someone? We see that here. He is so swayed and hurt by Malkador's sacrifice that when the other Primarchs are watching Malkador on this throne and Vulcan mentally comments, I can feel his pain, I can feel his cells dying, Sanguinius corrects him and says, it's not his pain. Then he looks to the Emperor and says, it's yours, isn't it? And then, when the other Primarchs start talking about the Sigilite, the Emperor corrects them and says, the hero. And when he addresses the Chosen of Malkador and those in attendance who came after Malkador had sat down, many of whom are now crying at this point, I feel like we forget just how beloved Malkador was. He really was the heart of the Loyalist cause. He tells them, Regard him now as nothing less than the greatest hero of our age, and see yourselves to do his will. The Emperor is often depicted, especially when he's spoken about in a more recent context, as being very cold, very using. He only ever saw the Primarchs as tools. He only used people. They were just objects to him. That much isn't really that true. Because would someone that cold view Malkador in this way? I don't think so. It's to the point where Malkador literally has to assure him and say, don't be sad. To me, this does not feel like the cold barbarian tyrant that Erda described. 
Erda talked about him as if he was just the worst person ever, as if he was this horrible, abusive monster who was gonna burn the galaxy down. And even John Grammaticus thought that to an extent. But this leads me to believe that neither of them truly understood him on the deepest level. Especially not Erda, which is ironic considering she's the mother of the Prime. well she was the mother of the Primarchs. This is coupled with the fact that we find out Magnus's massive psychic potential was made very deliberately to serve as a proxy to sit on the Golden Throne so that Malkador wouldn't have to. He's cited as a contingency, and I think that's part of the reason why, up until the very end, they were still trying to convince Magnus to come back to their side before Vulcan had to step in and defeat him in one of the earlier novellas. We also find out here that the Emperor had essentially plans for how everything was going to play out. Some people believe that the heresy was pre-planned, and this is due to a throwaway line of text from a short story where Malkador is talking to a dying comrade of his and sort of uses it to vent things he doesn't say out loud, where he says, the war came before we were ready. A lot of people think this to believe that the Emperor knew something like the heresy was going to happen eventually, but I don't think so. He knew there was going to be a final conflagration with Chaos, namely because we get confirmation from this book that the Emperor's power is in fact stolen from the gods. For whatever reason, he did trick them out of their power. It is specifically said to be stolen from them. Now, whenever it was previously said, you stole power from the gods about the Emperor, it was sort of said in a context where it could be interpreted that the fact that he used powers from the warp just kind of meant he indirectly stole it, and they're sort of just saying that in order to egg on Horus, but now we know it's true in a more almost Promethean kind of sense. And the prevailing theory among fans for a long time has been that when the Emperor went into the warp on Molech, he struck a deal with the Chaos Gods and offered them something which he never was going to pay back. Many fans interpret this to be his very soul, because while we do know he is a perpetual and would come back if killed, if he died and had his soul promised to the gods, that would completely remove him and stop him from coming back, which is something the Chaos Gods would want since they literally fear him, as Malkador has stated. So with these factors in mind, the fact that the gods do canonically fear him and that his power is stolen from them, it would make sense they'd eventually come for his neck. He knew something was coming, but I don't think he expected the heresy because we get outlines for what the Emperor had planned after the Great Crusade and after humanity was won. He wanted a peaceful life. He wanted to rule over the galaxy with his sons, and it is stated sons, and to be able to finally put down the sword and acclimate to a life of peace. This is something reflected by Rogel Dorn way earlier in the Siege of Terra, when he says, we were meant to be so much more than just warriors. He talks about this with Constantin Valdor. They were meant to be so much more than just warriors, they were meant to also be rulers in peacetime, but it now seems like that might never happen. Though it is stated, the Emperor only envisioned this future for the sons who could acclimate to a time of peace, who could be able to put down the sword, because as we the fans know, some of them likely never would have been able to get used to that life of peace. And the Emperor had hoped they would eventually die off during the Great Crusade, they would peacefully come to an end, but if they didn't, I feel like the Emperor probably would have had to put some of them down out of the Thunder Warriors. So very likely some of the Primarchs like Conrad Kurz or Angron, and if you can name any others in the comments, I would love to hear that, would have had to been taken care of if they didn't die off organically during the Great Crusade. It's just one of the more unpleasant facts of what the Emperor's plan was like and the reality of the situation, but on the whole, he did plan for a life of peace with his sons. That is ultimately what he wanted. Also, we do get more interesting information regarding the Emperor's past on Old Earth. As we've learned previously in the Siege of Terra, he and Olanius Persson were at the Tower of Babel when it was destroyed, and what the Tower of Babel really had was a full, basically, encyclopedia of Enuncia on its walls. Enuncia being an ancient language that is not warp-based in any way, but can affect reality just by being spoken. It's something that comes up as a recurring plot device in Dan Abnett's works, especially his Inquisition series. Funnily enough, the Emperor wanted to utilize Enuncia, but Olanius Pius went out of his way to have the tower destroyed, and he stabbed the Emperor, physically. Hence why the two parted ways and basically never spoke until now. Now what we learn in this book is that the Emperor was actually both Saint George in the past and Alexander the Great. 
which does actually confirm a theory that fans have had about the Emperor for a long, long time. That being, he likes men. Now, moving past this point, we see the Emperor finally board the Vengeful Spirit. Horus had dropped the shields. A lot of people thought it was just madness. Abaddon thought that. The Emperor thought that. They knew it was some kind of trap, but a trap you would have to be insane to even attempt. However, now that Malkador is on the throne and the Emperor has gone to go confront uh, Horus on his ship, we finally see the truth, namely, that Horus was never insane. He was completely lucid the entire time and putting on such an effective act as to fool everyone around him and the Emperor himself, because he knew the Emperor could feel him to a certain extent and he needed to keep up this facade in all things. Everything from envisioning people who are dead to being in the room with him, like Azardu Lake and Mercedes Alaton, to mistaking Argonus for Malakhurst, to just the random babbling. It's all been a front from the beginning to lure the Emperor into this trap, and now that the Emperor is aboard the Vengeful Spirit, he lets the mask slip. And the Custodes and the Emperor and all the Primarchs who come aboard, namely Rogel Dorn and Sanguinius, while Vulcan is still in the throne room, are completely caught off guard. They had no true concept of how powerful Horus has become, and now they're caught with their pants down. When the Emperor and the Custodes land aboard the Vengeful Spirit, everything seems completely fine. And this is one of the sections I'm sure you've all heard about because this one caused a lot of controversy. What happens is, they land on Embarkation Deck number 8, but the Vengeful Spirit only has 6 Embarkation Decks, 8 being the Sacred Number of Chaos, if you remember. Now, when they get here, everything feels perfectly fine, and the Custodes, namely from the point of view of the one we're looking at, find themselves completely at ease, and are just sort of enwrapped in nostalgia and looking around, but then realize they can't properly focus on anything. They feel groggy, disorientated, confused, and just caught in their own thoughts, and their minds are drifting and wandering. And then eventually, they all start having these thoughts. The Emperor must die. The Emperor must die. He really must die. Oh, he really should die. It's the only logical thing. You know, the Emperor is kind of an insane tyrant, so if we the Custodes kill him right now, he wouldn't be able to stop us because he's just an insane tyrant, and he really ought to die. It just makes sense. And it's at that moment, their eyes start to bleed, and they start hearing shrieking in their minds, and lose control of their bodies, and then lunge to attack the Emperor, who has no choice but to cut a lot of them down one by one, aside from the ones who have been able to stop themselves from attacking by simply not moving. They have to force themselves to not move a muscle or else they will jump to attack. And the thing is, they are aware of what they're doing, but can't control their bodies. It's possession. It's not corruption towards chaos. They are physically being possessed and controlled, and are screaming in anguish as they attack their master, because they really do love the Emperor. Each one is a boon companion and a gift to humanity. So this attempt by Horus is meant to not kill the Emperor, obviously it wouldn't. It's to hurt his resolve. It's to really hit him where it hurts and attack his compassion. But the custodian on the ground watching this finds it almost amusing behind his grief that he thinks this will work on the Emperor. The Emperor will do whatever it takes, and he's all-powerful, and you're just gonna make him angry. Good luck, Horus. And yeah, that's what happens. The Emperor is pissed now. Now, I know I'm relying a lot on excerpts here for this video, but I feel like a lot of these things can't be properly portrayed in anything other than the original text itself, because these scenes just go so hard. Now, in this scene here, the Custodians are fighting the Emperor, and Things are going back and forth, the Emperor's starting to take hits. He's been stabbed, he's been thrown against the railing, it's starting to turn. He's been spinning his blade and tearing Custodes apart with his massive power claw. But right here marks one of, I think, only two times throughout all the decades of 40k books that we see the Emperor truly bring his psychic might to bear on the field of battle. The only other time being when he summoned the ghosts of the dead space marines from Istvan and the ghost of Ferris Manus to help in the webway after he had had about one day to go and aid them due to the sacrifice of a thousand psychers. He is the emperor of mankind. He comes upon you in wrath, clad in his aspect of war. More than 30,000 years of work will not be undone by your malice and spite. That he is required to kill his own perfect warriors does not make him falter or weaken his resolve. It just makes him all the more determined to vanquish you. The Emperor raises his hand. Imperial lightning ripples out, a brilliant neon blue. 
The searing fork scorched the deck and hurled the Theranatoi into the air like sheaves of corn caught in a cyclone. One ricochets off the ceiling hoist, fragmenting. Two tumble over the platform edge and plunge down the shaft of the through deck elevator. Two hit a racked Stormbird so hard their armored bodies punch through the hull like breacher rounds. Four hit the deck with enough force to leave craters. One explodes, the power system in his Adrathic Beamer jarring to critical instability. The catastrophic detonation throws others off their feet. He sees the Hykonatoi bearing down the ramp on his master's right. He sees his master turn and look at the deck supervisor's console on the chamber wall a hundred meters away. He sees his master tense and spear the console with a telekine pulse and then duck to his knees. The ramp's ion launch cat the ramp's ion launch catapult fires the Stormbird he was thrown against. It slams over him, past him. Fueling cables stretch and snap in clouds of sparks. Its engines and systems are dead, so it's merely dead weight, slung by the ion rail's accelerator. The Stormbird mows down and pulverizes the Harkonatoi on the ramp. It keeps going, starting to tumble down the entire kilometer length of the rampway in an expanding, seething fireball, and finally obliterates as it impacts the invisible integrity field at the deck mouth. The Emperor rises to his feet. Loss, bitter pain, and fury have broken the lulling spell of indecision woven by the warp. His will is now entirely clear and engaged. Before any more screaming custodians can move, or rise, or act, he enforces it fully. The deck lamps dim, guide lights blow out, Consoles short and explode. Cables split cinders and sag from the ceiling systems. All the custodians still alive drop. Kalictus collapses onto his face. They're all screaming and writhing. It is no longer in torment or grief. It is simply in pain. Pain will do it. The Emperor applies more. Shrieking, Kalictus can hear his master's booming wrath inside the bulking bones of his skull. I will burn your touch out of them first found. Do you see what I am now? Do you see what is coming for you? This is the single biggest oh fuck moment in the entirety of Warhammer for me. I'm sorry, but oh fuck. And what's interesting to me is that immediately after this, the custodians who are still able to stand and rise, the ones that don't need to be euthanized by the Emperor because they can't get up and fight, are too ashamed to even look at the Emperor. They cannot even make eye contact or even look in his direction because, in the words of Calictus, the shame will never go away. They are so demoralized by what just happened. What this scene does so well is set up the scope of what is to come because these custodians don't even come off across as custodians or even like Space Marines, they seem like guardsmen. This is what it must be like to be a guardsman before a Space Marine. Just completely impotent and so full of dread and so diminished. This is the most vulnerable we've ever seen custodians and it's the most vulnerable we'll ever see them. This is not gonna happen again in any book, trust me. And also a little side note afterthought, we also see the Emperor grab a six ton ceramite door, rip it off its hinges, crumple it like paper and just toss it just to give some show of the sheer strength of this guy. Now, as you guys know, the Emperor did not go alone with his custodians. With him was Constantin Valdor, Sanguinius, and Rogel Dorn, with Vulcan staying behind and Jagatai Khan, while alive, still unconscious, as he is still healing from his fight with Mortarion. We covered what's going on with Valdor, but what about Sanguinius and Rogel Dorn? Now, while Sanguinius was separated from the Emperor when they embarked, he generally speaking is doing fine. He's with the bulk of his warriors, and they are pushing forward, fighting through traitor marines and demons as they go. Sanguinius is very determined to be the first one to face Horus by reaching him in his throne room, because Sanguinius has been having these recurrent prophetic visions of himself dying to Horus. But unlike Conrad Kurz, he's not one to submit to fate. He believes it is his destiny to face Horus, but he believes he can win. He believes he can defy fate, as he has done before. Actually, the Emperor wanted Sanguinius to be the one to stay in the throne room and to serve as the quote-unquote new war master in the time being, but he talked him out of it and Vulcan ended up taking his place. Now, granted, we know how that ends. 
he faces Horus aboard the Vengeful Spirit and is killed. Only for the Emperor to show up immediately afterward, and then, as some people say, be able to strike Horus down by hitting a chink in the armor that Sanguinius created with his spear. What's really interesting, and is a huge lore update in this book, is what happens with Rogel Dorn because it's always been part of the old lore that Dorne gets to the throne room very, very late. Sanguinius is dead. Horus is dead. The Emperor is mortally wounded. He gets there only in time to carry the Emperor just barely alive and have him interred on the Golden Throne. In this book, we finally see why that is, what exactly happened, and oh boy, it is so much more wild than anyone could have expected. When we catch up with Rogel Dorn, we find out he's never even properly made fall on the Vengeful Spirit. Because when we find him, he's already in a desert that he's been wandering around in for almost a century by this point. Something went totally wrong, and he's in a desert. I think it's some kind of warp pocket dimension. And he's alone. Mostly. Because scattered all around him are the bodies of dead Imperial Fists. When he gets there, he actually tries counting the dead Imperial Fists around him in order to keep information coming into his mind, focus on something, and keep himself sane. He tries notching their pauldrons to count them one by one, and finds there are tens of thousands before he starts properly losing count himself. And over time, this attempts to do this, wear down his sword over and over, until it becomes dull, till it becomes notched, till it becomes just a rusted shank of metal. In this desert, there are just endless dunes of sand and large labyrinthine walls. Dorn is actually able to climb on top of these dunes to try and see barely over the walls to where they go to, and it's just endless stretches of maze walls that are so far apart in this desert realm where the sun shines constantly, but there is no sun. Dorn eventually begins... Dorn eventually begins to believe that there is no way out of here. He comes to accept that as a fact. But, he also eventually starts to give way to the thought that maybe there's no way in either. That he just is here. And over time, we see his mental faculties deteriorate. He starts by telling himself, I am Rogel Dorn, Praetorian of Terra, Primarch of the Seventh Legion at Imperial Fists, Seventh Found Son, Defiant and Unyielding. He says this day in and day out, and then orders every fact in his mind. He was at the Siege of Terra. He is now here in this yellow place. He was trying to board the Vengeful Spirit, but something went wrong and he's been teleported here. There are these walls. They are an ancient, faded pink color. There are dead Imperial Fists. They look to have been dead for a long time. They're all skeletons. And so on and so on. But, over the course of the century he is trapped here, the color of the desert sands themselves begin to change. They begin to grow darker, as if they are slowly rusting and turning pink and then dark brown like the walls he is near. And the armor on the Imperial Fists begins to chip off too, to the point where it's only just little flecks of yellow around his feet. And then he begins to wonder, hey, is this entire desert just made of rust flecks? It's things like this, and the changing of the environment, and his lack of control, and just the never-ending sun and sand that really begins to wear him down. And the rusting of facts in his mind. That mantra he used to tell himself begins to deteriorate over time, to the point where he's just telling himself, uh, I am Rogel Dorn, Praetorian, Seventh Found Son, Defiant and Unyielding. Um, I am Rogel Dorn, Seventh Found Son, Defiant and Unyielding. I am Rogel Dorn, Defiant and Unyielding. I am Rogel Dorn, Defiant. It just keeps going less and less and less, because as hard as he tries, he is being slowly, slowly worn down. And, as he is, he begins to actually like it in a way. Finally, he can just sit and be. There's no facts for him to order, no constant barrage of data, he doesn't have to be the emotional and military rock that keeps the entire siege together. There was a siege, right? He's sure there was a siege at some point, but that's gotta be long over by now. Victors won, losers lost, it's out of his hands, he doesn't need to worry about it. He, like, reflects on how oftentimes he truly longed to just stop directing everything, stop being the one who reigns in Jagatai Khan and Sanguinius, and go out there on the wall and fight. Truly fight like a warrior. He talks about how there were more facts during the siege than grains of sand in this whole desert, and only he could order them all, only he could direct them all, 
and it was this unbearable mental burden, and it just took so much out of him. You very rarely ever see a Primarch truly reach their limit, and I feel like it's something everyone completely forgot throughout the whole Siege of Terra. Just the sheer monumental burden that was taken on by Rogel Dorn to keep the Imperium alive and to fight this last battle. And honestly, it's a little bit funny how in an earlier book in the Siege of Terra, Perturabo is described as having taken on all the information to direct the largest siege in history, with himself plugged directly into his computers right through neural links, and Abaddon comments that for the first time ever, the Lord of Iron looks happy. And it's at this moment of weakness, this period alone in the desert with nothing to do but sit and think about not thinking after centuries that the desert finally makes its move. Later that century, the rusting brown cast of the desert and the walls and the sky have grown darker still. It is red. Everything and everywhere is red, like blood, the color of blood scarlet out in the sunlight, across the endless dunes and crimson, madder and orchil hues in the dark shadows of the wall. He remembers, sometimes, longing for blood. The fire of blood, the gush of blood, the physicality of blood. He wanted that simplicity. He wanted to fight, in a blood fight, spilling blood close up, not fight with his mind from a distance. He wanted to put the mental fight aside, Give up the crippling, endless puzzle of war, the never-ending facts and data, and just be a man with a sword. Just give up. Stop thinking and give in. Just fight. Just fight mindlessly. Just be free. Just fight and kill for blood. For blood. The color of this desert. Just blood for the sake of blood. Simple. Released. I'm thinking. Just blood. Blood for... How long ago was that? Who was there? Does it matter which side he was on? He tried to order the available facts. He was a warrior who just wanted to kill. They wouldn't let him kill. They wanted him to think. They wanted him to decide everything. They wanted him to order the available facts because they said he was good at it. He didn't want to decide. He didn't want to have to make those decisions. It was killing him. He never told anyone that. He wanted to stop and make somebody else decide. Make somebody else order the available facts. All he wanted to do was go to the walls and forget it. All and fight. A man with a sword. Just fight. No thought, no decisions. Just fight. Mindlessly, free, the way the others did. Just fight. Spill blood. That's all. Just blood. Blood for the- Just give up. I am Rogel Dorn. Defiant, says Rogel Dorn. Just give in. I am Rogel Dorn, says Rogel Dorn, sitting in the crimson shadow under the red wall. Are you even that? Were you ever? Just give in. I, I, I am Rogel, says Rogel. No, not even that. Don't think. That's all you really wanted, isn't it? Not to have to think anymore. You can do that here, in the shadow of the wall. Just give up. Give in. He orders the available facts. I... He says. Is there anything he's certain of any longer? All the facts have rusted. All the thoughts have gone. There's only blood. That's all he really wanted. Give in to that. I... He says, Just blood. Say it. I... Say it. Say blood. The thing you wanted. Blood. He says softly, soft as the flecks of rust to the dry breeze, lifts and horsetail plumes from the ridges of the dunes. Say it again. Blood. Who's the blood for? For... Say it! Who's the blood for? Blood... For the... For? For whom? He's waiting for you! You just have... To say it! Okay, so... I know this is supposed to be a really tense scene. I know there was like two chapters leading up to this line. 
I know it's supposed to show his whittling resolve and the sheer torture he's been under throughout the beginning of the siege and especially now in the desert, but I can't help but find this scene hilarious. <laughs> I'm sorry. What this sounds like to me is a kindergarten teacher talking to a new student. That's how this comes across. <laughs> and what's your name? I'm um, Rogel. And what do you want, Rogel? Blood. Who's the blood for? Come on. Come on. Like, <laughs> he sounds, he doesn't sound like his will is breaking. He sounds stoned. Like, hey, can I get a fucking, uh, blood for the fucking, uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this one of those scenes is just beyond me. I think it's a me thing. So that does it. That really covers where everything has gone so far, where all our important players are, and the state of things going into the final book in the Horus Heresy series. Except for one thing. On the very last page of the book, we get to catch up with Kirill Sinderman and Garvia Loken. What happens is, Kirill Sinderman is in the Hall of Lang, which is the Emperor's personal library. He and a few others are there looking for some information on demons that could help them turn the tide of the war. Because if that information is going to be anywhere, it'll be in the Emperor's personal library. And there, they inexplicably meet Garvia Loken. And while the two are talking, a door inexplicably appears in the hall. When they notice it, Garvia Loken goes in to investigate and tells everyone to stay behind. But once he's through the door and realizes where he is, he closes the hatch behind them and continues on forward so they can't follow him. I'll let this page, the very last page in the book, speak for itself. Once the hatch is shut, he unclamps his helm from his waist and puts it on. He locks the neck seals and wakes the visor. Over his back, he draws Mornadol and Rubio's blade. Logan begins to walk forward. He pauses at the stencil marker and reads it again, just to make sure he hasn't made a mistake. He hasn't. He is standing in sub-access, port ventral, 423762. He is aboard the Vengeful Spirit. Jesus. Now, I'm gonna be honest, that's a really cheap narrative technique. A random portal to the right place at the right time just opens up for the right guy to be there. That is so cheap. But you know what? I'm a bit of a sucker for it because I really, really like Garvia Loken, and I think it's gonna be really awesome that he'll be there at the end. And what we've seen in Saturnine is the effective potential retconning, well, very likely retconning, of the Alanius Pius story, where a character named Olanius Piers, named after his grandfather, no relation to the actual character, essentially sponsors a Remembrancer, well, the people who used to be called the Remembrancers, to write a fake story about him where he had stood with a group of soldiers against a charging World Eater who was cut down by a Sister of Silence that they couldn't see. And over the course of this book, he had been explaining to this Remembrancer with him, Harry Har, why soldiers lie, why soldiers make up stories, why soldiers exaggerate, and eventually, why soldiers are beginning to believe in the Lectitio Divinitatus, because it gives them hope and helps them comprehend and cope with the horror that they face in their line of duty. So, a fake story gets spread about a character named Olanius Piers, or Olanius Pius, who saved the Emperor from Horus because Ollie had said to Hari that, hey, don't just write that we and a bunch of other people stood against this one space marine. Tell them it was Angron. No, 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 tell them it was Horus. And don't tell them we were defending this banner of the Emperor's face. Tell them it was the Emperor himself. How about that? Because that story is so cool. Then we see Harry think for a bit and then start typing on his data slate. This pissed people off to no end because it's essentially spat in the face of what was such a well-established piece of canon for so long, the story of Alanius Pius the Saint. And for a long time, we thought it was going to be the Emperor's old friend, Alanius Persson, who's going to come to fill that role. It went from just a random guardsman to, oh, it's a perpetual old friend of the Emperor, to all of a sudden, in one book, oh, that whole story was fake. I think the authors have sensed how much we hated that retcon, and are going to try and do something similar, but with Garvia Loken. I think Garvia Loken will sacrifice his life to confront Horus and save the Emperor in that last moment. 
and I think it would be a really, really fitting send-off for the character, because, remember, the very first line in the entire Horus Heresy series is from Garvia Loken, where he says, I was there the day Horus slew the Emperor, all the way back in Horus Rising, over 17 years ago. Though, unfortunately, if he does die during that final confrontation, it would rob us of having the very last line in The End and the Death Volume 2 to be Garvia Loken saying, I was there the day the Emperor slew Horus. But actually, now that I think about it, maybe we will get that. Because if they can bullshit Garvia Loken onto the Vengeful Spirit, there's probably gonna be a way to bullshit Alanius Pius, John Grammaticus, and the Argonauts onto the Vengeful Spirit, just so at that final, climactic, penultimate moment we've been waiting for since before some people in the fandom were even born, we can have John Grammaticus there. Don't, uh, don't you want, aren't you excited for that? Aren't you excited for John Grammaticus to see the Emperor kill Horus and be like, well, that just happened? Whoa. I think I might actually kill myself if they do that in the last book. Because <laughs> it is Dan Abnett writing this one also. But like, seriously, some of my predictions for The End and the Death Volume 2 are that one, Lorgar will be involved out of nowhere. He's probably making his way to Terra already. There will be some sort of confrontation with him and Barthusa Naharek, who I, I don't imagine Naharek completely whiffing and doing nothing, but I he's not gonna kill Lorgar, let's be honest here. I'm also 50-50 split on whether or not Jagatai Khan will wake up in time for any of the events of the last book to really take place, or maybe if he'll need to be taken back to Chagorth for that to happen. But either way, I think he's effectively out of the story, even if he does wake up. Gilman and the Lion are gonna come after the fact. Russ won't be far behind, we know this. Also, again, I have this horrible feeling that the Argonauts, John Grammaticus, and Alanius Pius are gonna end up on the Vengeful Spirit. Please, God. Um, Garvia Loken is obviously making his way, he'll be there at the final battle. Euphrates Keeler, I suspect, will probably survive the war. Uh, Katsuhiro, I don't know what will happen to him, but hopefully it's something because there's been such a big emphasis on him throughout the series and him carrying this child with him that was given to him by a White Scar's space marine, Shiban Khan. Uh, Octay, I foresee dying. I think the Alpha Legion will also probably play some kind of role. Remember, Ingo Peck is still down there. I don't know if Grammaticus will go back for him, but there could be other operatives. Maybe uh, Omegon himself might make an appearance, or just other Alpha Legion elements to tie up that loose end nicely. Valdor is known to essentially walk off and disappear. We know from other Dan Abnett books that he's been in this city in the warp and identifying himself as the king in yellow for the past little while. Sanguinius will die, the Emperor will be interred, these things we know to be fact. And Rogel Dorn, he's obviously not gonna fall to Korn. I do not think he will in any capacity. And even if he kinda quote unquote does, it'll only be for a very brief period of time. And this is all sort of used as an explanation as to why he was so late getting to the throne room uh, and only found the Emperor dead, but was there in time to inter him. Maybe someone will come along and snap him out of it, either Garvia Loken or possibly even Sigismund, because Sigismund is only mentioned once in this book in the internal monologue of another Imperial Fist, Fafnir Rand, where he thinks that, oh, Sigismund is either dead or occupied somewhere else because nobody can get a hold of him, command structure is breaking down, that sort of thing. He's completely AWOL in this book, so maybe he'll turn up at the very last second to help, that would be really contrived, but again, who knows, anything's up in the air at this point. So. All in all, a lot of things to expect and be wary of going into The End and the Death Volume 2 and wrapping up the entire Horus Heresy. It's anyone's game. We know what happens all in all, but the plot threads that will lead into books after this, whatever they do, be it The Scouring or other such storylines, especially considering this is an Abnet book. So until that release comes, I don't want to make too many speculations or make an ass of myself. So let's all wait and see and just pray that this goes somewhere good instead of them dropping the ball at the end because you know how it is with Black Library. And sorry to do this, but to get a little personal here, I am so honored to be able to make this video and talk about this. Warhammer means so much to me. And to be here at the end of all of this, at the end of the biggest storyline and probably one of the biggest series in sci-fi, is so monumental and kind of moving in a way. I never thought I would be contributing in this way. And even though probably not many people are gonna see this video, the fact that there are people willing to hear what I have to say on the matter and that I can put my voice out there and be a part of the narrative and 
be involved in all this is so humbling to me. It, it really does move me. In my life, there have been about two or three instances where 40k has been the only thing that has either saved my life or gotten me out of a really, really dark place. And again, just contributing to the fandom and being here on this journey as things have gone from start to finish, all the way from Horse Rising to here, just makes me really feel like I'm giving back to this thing that has done so much for me and this community that's been there for me through some genuinely heinous times. With all of this in mind, it really makes me wonder where things are going to go from here and how I'm going to be able to contribute in that way. Yeah, I've been working on some stuff with Arx Vomen, I am so sorry for being late on that video, and just stuff in general, like are we going to go through the Scouring, the Badab War, things like that. And with all of that said, and with all the hype gathered for the End in the Death Volume 2 and the final chapter in the Horus Heresy Saga, let me know what you think of this book and everything in this video in the comments below, and I will see you in the next video.